So welcome everyone to the Center for Healthy Sex monthly Sexpert webinar series. Um, today, as you know, we have Dr. Carol Clark with us, who's going to talk to you about intimacy and connection and recovery. I'm Alexandra Katahakis, the clinical director of the Center for Healthy Sex in Los Angeles, where we treat a broad spectrum of sexuality, uh, offering individual group couples therapy for local people. Um, we also offer intensive programs for men and women, both locally and from all over the world. So if you have questions about sexual issues raging from, raging from, not raging, but, um, you know, issues of sexual desire, dysfunction, compulsivity, or are really looking for optimal sexual pleasure in your relationships as an end goal, you can call us at 310-843-9902, and our intake counselors are available anytime before, during, or after this webinar. So as I said, uh, Dr. Carol Clark is going to be talking about intimacy and connection today in recovery. Dr. Clark is a licensed mental health counselor in South Florida, working for both private and government substance abuse and counseling programs since 1993. She has a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in counseling, and in 1996, she became a certified addictions professional, and in 1997, earned her PhD in human sexuality. Dr. Clark specializes in working with sex addicts and their partners, as well as transgender individuals providing services in her practice and around the country by telephone and internet video conferencing. She teaches graduate courses, conducts custody investigations for the courts, and provides continuing education for nurses, psychologists, counselors, social workers throughout Florida. Dr. Clark is a certified supervisor for counseling interns and opened the Sex Therapy Training Institute and the Addictions Therapy Training Institute in order to prepare and train future sex therapists and addiction professionals to continue the work, uh, the important work in these fields. Recently, she created the International Transgender Certification Association, offering certification to clinicians, professionals, and specialists in transgender care. Carol is the author of the book, Addict America, The Lost Connection. So without further ado, I turn you over to Dr. Carol Clark. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. This is awesome to reach out to so many people around the world. That is wonderful. Uh, so I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about myself and because that's how I got to be here today. Um, in addition to just the schools that you mentioned, I now have a PhD program, the International Institute of Clinical Sexology, and one of my students is here, Monique, there from uh, Northern Alberta. So. It's good to see you on here, Monique. Um, I have spent my life working towards this time when I can now really have something to give back and to pass on. And so that's a lot of what I'm doing now with my teaching. I'm, I started out my life as a child of an alcoholic and my mother was really uh, codependent. <laughs> and so I'm, I have a lot of typical um, things in my life that uh, so many people deal with. And it brought me to a place where I was really angry with addicts. And then eventually I came around to embracing addicts and addiction and with understanding and compassion as the people in my life went into recovery. Um, I, on my journey towards being uh, a sex therapist, I began to incorporate the addiction and the sex therapy to work with sex addiction, uh, people who are dealing with sex addiction. And <clears throat> so then over the last 20 years really of doing that, I started to conceptualize um, what this is all about. And that's what I'm bringing into my teaching today and in general. So we're going to talk about intimacy and connection in recovery. And let's 
Next slide. So our learning objectives describe the concept of addiction as a global condition relating to overall stimulation, as opposed to being specific to a particular drug or activity. We're going to describe how addiction develops from a sphere of intimacy and then creates a barrier to intimacy. We're going to di differentiate between truly intimate relationships and pseudo intimacy, which is typical of sex addiction. Uh, this presentation has been used uh, with a lot of therapists. So I see we have a lot of recovering people here. So um, we'll generalize to how recovering people can use this themselves, as well as how the therapists in the audience can use this with clients who are working on recovery. So we're going to assist clients and recovering people with defining the concepts of external versus internal control and how they use this in controlling degrees of intimacy. And I do have a book, Addict America, The Lost Connection, and I hope you all look for that on Amazon. And it's a great resource for both therapists and for recovering people and for everyone, because the reason I called it Addict America is because actually I think Americans are all addicts. And for those of you in other countries, um, <laughs> yay, you're, <laughs> but we, Americans are exporting addiction um, quickly. And um, so beware. Um, it's just that Americans have that, bring that energy of more is better. Um, you know, we eat more. You know, I know people in Europe are always laughing at the size of our portions. Um, so it's that kind of mentality that we have to do more and more and more. And that's what addiction is all about. Um, oops. So connection. We're going to define intimacy. This is kind of our working, what we're, we're going to work on today. Define intimacy. And what I'd like you to do right now as I review the rest of these is start chatting in um, some of the uh, definitions, your definitions of intimacy. What does intimacy mean? So if you could start chatting them in and then we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, addiction is a barrier to intimacy. We're going to look at how that happens, what's going on in the brain, external versus internal locus of control, and the chicken or the egg, what comes first? The cycle of addictive thinking that leads to acting out. What can we do? I want to make this very practical. Um, what are some actual interventions? What are things you can actually do on a, a behavioral hands-on level. Uh, eight types of intimacy. And we're going to generate intimate activities in connection. All right. So what is intimacy? So we had some people answer. And uh, I think we had people introduce a vul vulnerability, closeness, connection, attunement to self and others. Connection, attunement, I like that. So attunement, that suggests being connected on this limbic system level, maybe vibrating together, uh, being true to myself and vulnerable to others. I love that uh, uh, idea of vulnerability because keep that in mind as we're talking today. Um, vulnerability goes to one of those paradoxes that are so prevalent in addiction and recovery. We have so many paradoxes like step one, you know, admit we're powerless in order to gain power over ourselves, right? That's, a, that's paradoxical. So this idea of vulnerability, opening oneself up to be vulnerable, and yet when we can actually get to a place where we can do that, we're not really vulnerable because we're not allowing someone else. To, once we're open to someone hurting us, um, it's really from a place where we won't be hurt because we're good with ourselves. So kind of keep that in mind. Uh, let's see what else we said. Robert says, seeing into me and others as God intended. Howard says, intimacy is a deep level of interconnection where two or more individuals, I like the more, yes, two or more. We want to open this up to any, to more than just couples. 
where two or more individuals are willing to be engaged in open, vulnerable interactions. That word vulnerability keeps coming up. Being able to be completely vulnerable while, while being myself. And uh, Danielle, you have your chat on private to presenters, but I'm actually going to read it out loud, <laughs> if you don't mind. You might want to change that setting on your chat. I feel, uh, if that's okay, <laughs> I feel intimacy is feeling safe to share your humanity, faults and strengths both, through a feeling of mutual safety. Yeah, good, good stuff there. So. Intimacy and connection really are just the same thing. They're, they're different words for the same thing. Connecting is being connected, being nothing being between you and someone else. And um, being present with each other, which we know is one of the hallmarks between being in addiction and being in recovery. Being in addiction is not being present. It's being somewhere else. It's being looking for the next high. It's being in drama. And being in recovery is being present. And anytime you're truly present, then you're capable of connection because otherwise you're out here somewhere. And then you're capable of intimacy. So experiencing the same thing at the same time. So two people sharing the same space, having the same experience, being present together. And sharing bodies, emotions, and experiences. So these are some other definitions of intimacy. Sharing our bodies. A lot of people, and, and I like that you all have uh, really picked up on the idea that intimacy is not just about sex. <laughs> Intimacy is the whole experience, the whole package that goes beyond sex. One of the things that I like to really emphasize with people who come to me as a sex therapist and they say, oh, we're having trouble with, with intimacy. And I'll say, well, what is intimacy? And I'll say, well, our sex lives. And one of the things I do is help them reframe that rather than having sex in order to feel intimate, you know, as many people do, they're having sex in order to feel like they're connected. And it really, that doesn't work as, as pretty much probably all of you know. So what we want to do is feel intimate first, and then sex becomes an expression of intimacy. It's an expression of that. So then it doesn't matter how you do it or what you're doing or all the different things that can encompass sexual behavior so that we're not saying there's any sexual behavior that's bad or wrong or anything. If it's done as an expression of intimacy, then it's a way of connecting. And that really gets to our topic today of um, intimacy and connection and recovery. So we have, uh, thank you for this, Asha, hoping to understand for myself and others, experiencing the same thing at the same time is something that fosters a feeling of safety in my experience. Thank you. Yeah, this, this idea of safety and vulnerability keep coming up. I like that. So we're going to describe the concept of addiction as a global condition relating to overall stimulation as opposed to being specific to a particular drug or activity. So I look at addiction as obsessive, compulsive, out of control behavior done in spite of negative consequences, self or others. That's it. And I would love <laughs> one of these days in my spare time to actually put together something to uh, present to the ICD people and the DSM people, get rid of all this, you know, alcohol disorder, use disorders, dependence disorders, all of that. Addiction. Let's have addiction as obsessive compulsive, out of control behavior. Behavior, just behavior. Done by negative consequences, self or others. And then put specifiers as the drug of choice or drugs of choice. So a specifier would be cocaine or some sexual behavior or shopping or gambling or internet or iPhones. <laughs> okay, those would be the specifiers. You like that, thanks. <laughs> so then that would take out all the back and forth 
with is sex an addiction? Can sex be an addiction? Can eating be an addiction? Or what about, you know, drugs? All gone, all gone. Just addiction. It's addiction. And then there we go. And so what are we really addicted to? If we're not going to be addicted to, if we're going to be addicted and we're not addicted to sex, to drugs, to shopping, whatever. Well, what's really happening? We know. So I think most of you, and if if any of you have questions, ask me. I think most of you understand about the dopamine reward system, since so many of you are in recovery or are therapists. So you understand the dopamine reward system and what causes dopamine transmitters to fire? Stimulation, right? So that's if we're addicted to anything, it's to stimulation. Ah, blessings, Peter, gratefully recovering addict. <clears throat> so we're addicted to stimulation. And then it becomes, where do we get our stimulation from? Do we get it from sex? Do we get it from drugs? Do we get it from anger? Anger is very addictive, right? Drama. When people are in this constant state of drama, they are in addiction. So we can't really be in recovery. We can be in abstinence. We can be white knuckling it. But we can't really be in recovery unless we're living in recovery and not really being focused on abstaining from a drug. <clears throat> so there are no cross addictions. It's about being an addict. No multiple addictions, no replacement addictions. It's being an addict and grabbing stimulation from wherever we can. Any thoughts or comments about that? <clears throat> Can anybody relate to that? Can anybody who maybe doesn't identify as an addict say, oh, maybe I have a little of that? (laughs) So I know personally, (laughs) okay, we got some people relating. (laughs) So I can recognize personally without having to say, um, without being, and, and I am personally not, I don't identify as a recovering addict um, that, that would, you know, I want to honor all of you who are truly in recovery and have done that work, which is the hardest work anyone can do. Um, I do recognize how I can move from an addictive state into a recovering state. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Kevin is saying, what about addiction as an escape? We're going to talk about that. Versus stimulation. Yes, we're going to talk about that. I do think difference between substance and process addictions, the goals are different. Um, that I'm not sure how much time we'll have to talk about that today, Howard. Um, how about bring that up, Howard, at the end? And after I've gone through all the other things I'm going to go through today and, and then see if we can plug it into uh, or narrow down what um what you're thinking about with that um therapists are certain once addiction and pathological pathological relationship with a mind altering experience <clears throat> okay adverse ch- we're going to talk about childhood experience okay <laughs> okay so one of the things i was just saying is i can recognize for myself that for instance if i'm one time I was driving, I left my, I said, Oh, I want to do this. I had this impulse. I wanted something. I wanted to go buy something. I only had an hour to do it before I had a client that was going to show up at the door and I'm racing to get to the store and get this thing. And then of course it didn't work. They didn't have the thing. And then do I have time to get to another store and I'm racing around and okay. You can feel the addictive energy there. Right. And And I said to myself, you're in addiction. You are being a total addict right now. And you know what? I didn't care, right? Case of the, you know, (laughs) I I didn't care. And so what I've, you know, what I've had to do is on the front end, stop myself and say, no, 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 we're not going there. We're not even going to stop that. We're not even going to stop that. We're going to We need to mindfully choose to be in a recovering place every day. Um, 
Yeah, uh, using our natural good design in an unintended and unnatural way. And we're going to look at how that happens. How do we get out of balance? How does that become so normal? For me as a child of an alcoholic and being in a family where that drama was there, that's already predisposing me to addiction, right? So here we are. The biggest motivator of human behavior is the need to belong to the group. Really take that in. The biggest motivator of human behavior is the need to belong to the group. Our primary group is our family of origin, right? And this comes from the limbic system. What I, in my book, I call it the caveman brain. Some people call it the reptile brain, whatever. So it's the limbic system, the non consciously thinking, but survival, pleasure. The reason we experience pleasure right, is for survival. The things that are pleasurable help us survive. So this part of the brain, where also memory is, so we can remember what causes us pleasure and seek more of it, okay, that's the part of the brain that needs to connect. We are social beings. We need to be in a group. We're not going to do very well on our own when it comes to survival of personally or survival of the species. We need to function in a group. So it's a primitive biological state. It's something we need. And, you know, I'm, I'm all about the universe and life connection, the force, the tree of life. So we are all connected. The electrical grid, <laughs> however you want to frame that, we are all connected. And it's just there. What we do is we put disconnectors in our way. And we're going to look at why do we do that? Well, messages from childhood. Our primary group, our most basic group is our family of origin. Okay. And we get these messages. What are those messages? We get, I'm not important. I'm worthless. I'm not good enough. I'm a bad person. So these aren't necessarily big traumatic events. They're what we call, you know, we have big T traumas like 9-11, or we have small T traumas, which are what most of us deal with and have dealt with all the time. And, you know, the kid that comes home with a report card where, with a B, and the parent, and sometimes, sometimes parents are overly critical, and sometimes they're just, they're thinking that they're doing a good thing, they're motivating. And the kid comes home with a B and the parent's like, no, come on. I know you can get an A. I know you can do it. And what does the child hear? The child hears, I'm not good enough. Right? The child, a gay child, even the little child already knows they're, they're different. They're gay. They're trans. They're something. And here's parents saying, oh, look at those people over there. What do they take in? There's something wrong with me. There's something fundamentally wrong with me. I'm a bad person. I'm not good enough. I'm worthless. Okay. Our parents get divorced. And because kids see everything through themselves, everything is through anyone who has kids knows that kids think everything is their fault. They think that they could control the universe. And of course, they can't, but it, they got to wait till they grow up to figure that out. So they think that it's all about them, right? So let's see what Danielle is saying here. Identify living in recovery um, for a couple of process addictions, processing with some current behaviors, perfectionism, addiction to perfection, <laughs> or trying to overcompensate to, to believe. And this is where we're going to talk about, Danielle, the external versus internal locus of control. Because what you're saying here, needing to be perfect, is about trying to get the rest external world to see that you're perfect, to never make mistakes, to not be vulnerable. And recovery is about getting good with yourself. And here's a little helpful hint for you all. I like to give you practical things all the time. Instead of fighting with that, because fighting that, I'm perfect. Well, I don't have to be perfect. No, you don't. Okay, that's addiction. Okay, that's that addictive because it's causing you a lot of stimulation, stress, stimulation. Just say, so what? So practice saying, so what? I'm not perfect. Don't argue with it. I'm not perfect. I'm, brave. I'm not perfect. So what? 
So you can all practice that. Whatever it is you're telling yourself you have to do, <laughs> just say, so what? <laughs> okay, quick little, quick behavior change there. Um, some of my behavior at this point is simply preference related. Uh, no shame spiral experience when I'm not perfect, which to me indicates perhaps a preference rather than addiction. Okay. Um, and uh, so you're working on, I can see you're working on this and you can look at, again, being aware of the energy you bring into that. Is it on the addiction side, like, oh my God, I got to be perfect. Ah, or, you know, I'm not perfect, and but I do want to do this really well. So whatever it is, pay attention to that. Am I in addiction? Am I in that addictive energy? Or am I in recovering energy? It's not so much about what the thing is, the behavior, the thing. It's, it's the energy you're bringing into it. Um. So Danielle definitely worked through my process addictions through processing childhood trauma, right? Noah saying critical inner voices. <laughs> so know, how do we achieve intimacy and recovery? Well, that that's what we're that's what the whole presentation today is about. Um, and Michael saying I'm not worthy is my main issue. And so, so Michael, thank you for sharing that. Um, what I do, and I think probably what most people, most therapists would help you with is, um, and, and believe me, I've done my own work on this too. I personally do EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing. It's a trauma intervention. It's super effective, super fast, and it's way better than talk therapy. We can, talk therapy has its place, and we can certainly talk about these things that you're talking about, and that has its place. But when it comes to processing trauma, because talking is here the limb, in the prefrontal cortex, which I call the enlightened brain. So the prefrontal cortex is the thinking, rational, logical, talking brain. So when you're talking, trying to talk yourself out of anything, believing that it's OK to not be perfect or talk yourself out of addiction, right? it's not going to work because the emotions the fears are back here in the limbic system, back in the caveman brain. Okay. So, ah, Danielle started EMDR this week. Yay. I've done a lot of EMDR myself <laughs> and I do it with all my clients. So looking at where did the message come from? So we look at, you say, I'm not worthy. Okay. Let's go all the way back to childhood. Where did that first emerge for you? What was happening? And that would be our target memory from which everything else comes because that that's where you get the filter through which everything comes through that I'm not worthy. And when you're saying I'm not worthy, that's going to be your barrier to intimacy. All right. So Robert's asking, how do we achieve intimacy and recovery? It's first dealing with all these negative messages and turning them around to both believe I am a worthy person and really incorporate that into ourselves and not base it on what anyone out here is doing. So I'm not going to base my worthiness on, <clears throat> you know, getting an A on a report card or getting, you know, positive feedback at work. Those things are nice. But it's not going to speak to my core being if I believe I'm a worthy person. And I'm certainly not going to base it on how good our sex is or in our relationship. I'm not going to go to, you know, you didn't do the dishes. You didn't help me with the dishes. So you don't care about me because I'm such a worthless person. See, we don't consciously think that, but it's back. That's what's going on. And there's our barrier to intimacy. You say we need to. So uh, Michael's saying um, from abandonment and rejection. Okay, wait, we had uh, Howard. Can you speak about the role, the way addictive responses become habituated in unconscious patterns of behavior? Uh, fire together, wire together. <laughs> yeah, so when these things happen as a child, if I come home and I have a B on my report card, and remember this isn't in isolation. If I have a parent who is telling me, no, you got to get an A, that's not the only time that parent has criticized me or told me, basically given me the un, 
spoken message, you're not good enough. I'm getting that message a lot, <laughs> a lot of times to the point where now it's just become part of my being. And now when I go into a, any kind of relationship, it's going to be there unconsciously. I'm not good enough. And there's where we control the intimacy. That's the barrier to intimacy. Okay. I'm approaching you and I kind of hit that wall where, oh, okay, this is good because unconsciously, if I get too close to you, you're going to see what an unworthy person I am, what a worthless person I am. And you're going to reject me. You're going to abandon me. And I won't belong. And that takes us back to not just belonging to the group, but, you know, belonging to other people. Okay, does that tie it together? And until we recognize that, we're not going to be able to heal from addiction. And let's talk about the addiction part. So the childhood messages create a barrier to intimacy. The fear of rejection leads to disconnection. Disconnection leads to pain. So here's, here's another huge piece of this. Disconnection leads to pain. It's painful. It's painful on the most primitive level, on my existential being. It's painful to be disconnected because I'm disconnected from the force, from the life force. I'm disconnected in my daily life. I'm disconnected from people I love and want to be connected with. And that causes great pain. So what's addiction all about? Hey, you all know it's relief of pain, right? Sure, attachment theory goes to this. So then, and then that brings us around. Here's that chicken or the egg thing. You know, addiction is a barrier to intimacy. Addiction is a barrier to intimacy, but addiction is causing the barrier to intimacy, but it's coming from our own limbic system. So we have to put all these pieces together. So now, so we have a lot of people and probably a lot of you know people who as teenagers, they start to drink or they looked at an internet pornography or they did any number of things that have the potential to be addictive and they don't become addicts. They might even do a lot of it and they don't become addicts. The missing piece is the pain. We need, the limbic system, the caveman brain, works on a lot of operant conditioning. So, uh, basic conditioning. Um, so, when my brain realizes that, <clears throat> oh, when I do this behavior that not only causes a spike in dopamine, it makes me feel really good, but there's it's coupled with that relief of pain. And that's what I remember. And that's what I want more of. Because if I'm not an addict and, and don't have that pain to escape from, then I'm going to do something that's going to feel really good. And then I'm going to go off and do other things and lead my life. But when I get that relief of that pain, oh, you know, maybe that's the first time I've had that relief. I didn't even know that pain was there until it was not there because I was high. And then I get, I sober up. And now that pain comes back and I'm still not consciously aware of it, but the pain is back. What am I going to do? No, I, I need something to relieve that pain now. And I'm going to do more. And because of the way the dopamine system works, our primitive brain, our caveman brain starts raising the baseline because it's trying to maintain the status quo. I'm trying to not just get high, but I'm trying to relieve that pain. So I'm going to keep doing more. The baseline goes up more and more and more Boom, out of control, right? Okay. Peter saying a transformative moment. My treatment was being on the floor saying, I am so alone. Oh, so it sounds like you were alone. You were doing your, your, you were in your addiction, which was easing the pain of being alone. And it was now removing the stimulation that led to the awareness, I am so alone. So perhaps we should save 10 minutes at the end. Okay. 
So Noah said, do you think addiction makes sense? Self-soothing behavior, adaptive behavior. Some of us has so much anxiety and we try to get relief through addiction. Um, and yes, we're 30 minutes away. I am going to try and be mindful of the time. And um, the um, self-soothing, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, that's the way it is. Yes, of course. Um, let's move along and see if things make sense for you. So I've been talking about our enlightened brain. The enlightened brain is also what gives us the awareness that there is a higher power. The unconscious brain knows it's there. But this part says, I, there is a higher power. I want to connect. The caveman brain is afraid of connection because it's developed that fear of connection. We cannot connect until we heal the negative childhood messages and relieve the fear. And that's where we need to do that trauma work and behavioral work. When I can push through my fear, that can also train my brain to say, this is okay. You know, that I can train my brain to say, oh, I can connect and it's okay. So that's the connecting to break the bad habits. So we have this desire to connect. We know we need to connect on whatever level we need to connect. And what we do is we develop these pseudo intimate relationships. And so for people who, um, for, and we, by the way, we, we can go a little bit longer, more than an hour. If some of you have questions, I'll get through the presentation, but then I will be happy to stay on longer if some of you have, want to talk about this more. So pseudo intimacy is trying to ease that need for connection and yet control it to get so close and no closer. And one of the things I did is I wrote up a little blog um, about intimacy by the numbers. That helps make it understandable for people. So for instance, say me growing up as a child with an alcoholic, I've developed a certain fear of intimacy and maybe I'm a three, maybe out of one to 10 with 10 being like, no, I don't want to have anything to do with you and one being totally connected. So maybe I'm a three or a four. I was lucky because uh, I did have a good first few years of my life. Thank you. Thank you. Higher power. Um, so if I meet someone who's a five or a seven, I'm going to be chasing them. They're going to be pulling away from me. And vice versa. If I meet a one, they're going to be chasing me because I'm going to try. And, so we're trying to maintain, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oops, I'm trying to get this in the side. <laughs> okay. So intimacy by the numbers. We are going to meet people who match us in fear of intimacy. So healing means both people really looking at, and we're not blaming anyone. You know, I'm not trying to pathologize anyone. I'm just saying that everyone needs to be working towards connection and looking at what are the barriers to connection in this um, going for intimacy. It doesn't fall all on one person because if we have one person healing and one person is maybe a seven in addiction, but then they go in recovery and now they're getting to be a three or a two or a one. If their partner isn't there with them, now we get that chasing thing. Does that make sense? Does that make sense to everybody? Um, Peter's talking about more connection. I came back from treatment, started asking people in my 12 step group, go for a meal. And they were attracted to me. Mm -hmm. And then they asked me uh, to sponsor them more connection. Yeah. So this intimacy by the numbers, um, again, uh, it's on my, uh, I think that one's on my website, drcarolclark.com, D-R-C-A-R-O-L-C-L-A-R-K.com. There's a bunch of little articles um, that I've spread around to my various websites. <laughs> uh, okay. So pseudo intimacy is um, when I used to be, I, I used to be a bartender um, a long time ago. And I would notice these guys coming into the bar, the alcoholics. <laughs> because they're there all the time. And they would say, oh, this is my second home. You're my family. You know, like uh, Norm and them and Cheers. Yeah, no, no, we're not your family. I'm not your family. I'm not inviting you over for Thanksgiving, okay? I'm smiling at you and interacting with you because I am a connecting person and, and you're a nice person. And it's also hurting me that you're drinking yourself to death and you're going to tip me, okay? So that's pseudo-intimate. 
That's the pseudo intimacy. And certainly for those of you who are sex addicts or working with sex addicts, a lot of pseudo intimacy going on there, right? You're doing anonymous sex. You're doing all kinds of sexual behaviors that are not truly intimate and connected. It's built in that it's a disconnect activity. If you are with a committed partner, someone that you emotionally love, and then you're doing something, whatever it is you're doing, there's a built-in barrier right there because you're never going to um, be able to get closer to whatever else you're doing out there. Um, so the um, that pseudo intimacy is, you know, people trying to get there and setting up these pseudo intimate relationships. And so what we want to do in a truly intimate relationship, so intimacy and connection and recovery is be connected, be aware of the connection and not be looking at ways to disconnect, to maintain that distance, to maintain that number. And uh, Jude, is it, are you saying a one has the lowest? It, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can give it a one or a 10. It's kind of arbitrary. But if you put it on one to 10. Yeah, trust. Again, um, kind of saying the hardship in sex addiction relations is to have trust. You know what? Trust. Let me just say something about that real quick. When I talk to people about trust when they're coming in for recovery, let's, let's re redefine trust. Trust is not that my partner is never going to act out again. No addict can ever say that. No non-addict can say that. Nobody can say that. Very few of us can say anything like I'm never going to do this or I'm like, no, we can't do it. All we can do is wake up this morning and eyeball to eyeball say, I trust that you love me. And you say it to me that you trust that you love me. And I trust that today we're going to be in recovery together or individual. I trust that you are going to work your recovery program today. That's the extent of trust. That's it. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, pseudo intimacy Getting past uh, in step one, step one, let me say something about step one. Step one is, is admit we're powerless, give it up to a higher power. So it's basically saying I can't control this. And that goes with I can't control anything. I can't control anything outside of myself. So to be intimate with another person means being connected and not trying to control the level of connection, the level of intimacy. It's letting go, being vulnerable, as we were talking, everybody was talking about earlier, being vulnerable and saying, here I am. I am fully open to being with you. And recognizing that if I'm saying that to my partner and there's some fear, the fear is coming from the childhood messages and I need to identify those and deal with them, either in therapy or however else you're doing it. Deal with the childhood messages that are causing the fear, that are putting up the barrier to intimacy. Okay? So, I've just been talking a bit about the external versus internal control. I need to believe I'm a good person. And if you're, I'm a worthwhile person. And if anything out here is telling me otherwise, you don't have that power over me. That's codependence. It's when what I think, do, say, feel is based on how someone else may think, do, feel, say. Okay? Can't do it. Speak your truth. Be true to yourself. I'm good with myself. If I bring my authentic self into our relationship without fear, then I'm capable of complete intimacy. I don't have to control it. I don't have to play power and control games. I don't have to look for escapes. I don't have to do anything because I can be with you without fear. And paradoxically, there will be no vulnerability. You cannot hurt me if I'm good with myself, right? Okay, so there's the serenity prayer, right? Now, I promised you some good exercises. 
So daily exercises, I have quite a few um, in the back of the book. It's not quite a workbook. I sort of call it a workbook, but it's not really a workbook. But I have a daily connection guide. And I, you know, going back to what I said in the beginning, we come into this, um, we can be in in addiction or we can be in recovery. We can make decisions about that all the time. And the more we're in doing recovering things, the less we're doing addictive things, right? So daily connection guide, how do we get connected? And if we're connecting, just doing like connecting type exercises, then we can connect intimately with our partner. So connecting with your inner self, appreciation. I have an appreciation exercise. It's on the website, drcarolclark.com. Look for appreciation exercise because the way I wrote it in the book, a lot of people don't quite get it. I didn't write it very well, but so I actually have somebody acting it out. And it's basically appreciating saying thank you to the universe for the gifts we're given and saying thank you for what we're able to give. It's very grounding. It's connecting that way. And there's an intention for a good day. So I wrote that out. And if you start your day off and that builds trust, if two people we will say two for now, <clears throat> if two people start their day off with an appreciation and they can express appreciation to each other and the intention for a good day that sets us on our intention that today we're going to have a good day. We're going to have a recovering day. Spread the light. And that's as simple as just smiling at someone. When you smile, there again, there's that connection, that universal connection. If I smile at you, you're probably going to smile back. If you don't, hey, that's not a reflection of me. I'm good with myself. Right? So if I smile at my partner, if I spread the light with my partner and they're not responding, it's important to recognize, okay, we have an intimacy problem and it's not necessarily my fault. And I'm trying to bring my authentic self here. You're not, what's going on? Let me get out of my head and see what's the meaning of this for you? What's going on for you right now? And <clears throat> recognize, <clears throat> excuse me, just recognize again, the, the serenity prayer that I can only do what I can do. And, you know, if you're having whatever's going on for you, that needs some healing. There's some healing there for you because your, your numbers aren't changing. So reflecting and active listening. Reflecting simply is when you reflect back what you're hearing from the other person. So what I hear you saying is, and do this before you get defensive, before you argue with somebody, before anything. Go with what I hear you saying is. And then you have the opportunity for the other person to say, yeah, you got it. Or, oh, that's not quite it. And there again, to connect, we have to have that completed transaction, as they call it in transactional analysis. It's about the completed communication. <clears throat> so active listening goes deeper. Active listening is actually thinking about what's the underlying meaning. So when I really know you, if I'm hearing you and then can get what the meaning is for you, I'm going to be able to actively listen. And the, the um, formula for that is to say back, so you sound and put in a feeling word, an emotion word. So you sound upset, you sound angry, you sound frustrated, you sound hurt. Go right for the emotion, about or because. And that's where not, a, so we wouldn't say, well, you sound upset because I didn't help you with the dishes. Mm. Active listening would be, you sound upset because since I didn't help you with the dishes, you're, you're thinking that I don't care about you or I don't appreciate what you're doing. You see? So <clears throat> that indicate that tells the other person that you're really getting them. And bringing this back to our intimacy and connection, that, that's what it is. It's are we connected? And let's simplify this real quick for a minute. If we're talking about sex, we're talking about how do you have good sex in recovery? <laughs> Cut to the chase. I love this. Men and women, forgive me making this broad generalization. It's just so 
Typical, typical, not everyone, typical. Men have this idea that as long as we're having sex, everything's good. The world could be collapsing. We could be having a million different problems. But as long as we're having sex, everything's fine. Women are the complete opposite. Women are like, no, everything has to be fine. We have to already be here feeling great about everything in order to have sex. Anybody want to? <laughs> okay. So this is where reflecting and active listening are so important. Because the reflective and active listening puts us both in the same place at the same time. The things you were saying are already intimate. And now we can all relax. And if we choose to express our intimacy through sexual behavior now, there we go. And we may do other things that are intimate. So reflecting and active listening. Creating healthy boundaries. And that's, that's simply, you know, looking at, again, that kind of that paradox. We want, we want to be connected, but we need healthy boundaries. We need to know that you can't control me. I can't control you. I'm not responsible for your anger, for your unhappiness, for anything, nor are you responsible for mine. So that's healthy boundaries. Because if, I, if recognize, if I think I can control you, if I think I can, oh, I'm not going to say this because I don't want to make you angry. I'm putting myself above you. I'm saying I have power over you. When there's power over Look, we're not connecting. We can't connect. Okay? We can't connect. And then, you know, the blame and everything else, we're not connecting. So that's the difference between, you know, um, the boundaries in codependence. <clears throat> Here's some recovery exercises. And I know people have been chatting over here, and I'll, I'll get to that when we're done with the slides here. Um, so down here in Florida, where I am, we have what's called a riptide. And a riptide is when the surface of the water looks perfectly smooth and calm, barely a ripple. But underneath, there's a strong tide. So usually, maybe the wind is kind of blowing and, and making the water look calm because it's underneath, though. You have this strong tide that's going out. The tide's going out but you don't see it on the surface. And so you go jump in the water, and next thing you know, you're being, you're being sucked out to sea. And a lot of people panic and they fight it and they're like, ah, and I got to swim and swim. And they exhaust themselves and drown and die. Okay, so we learn <laughs> when we live in South Florida, we get drilled into us. You don't struggle. You don't fight against the riptide. That would be addictive, wouldn't it? Right? We don't want to that's too stimulating. So we're not going to fight it. What do you do? We are taught. You float above it. You have a little bit of water on top of the riptide where you can just float on your back. And you can use your hands. You can't see my hands, but, you know, <laughs> you can kind of just, and you go parallel to the shore. You don't fight it. You don't want to get totally swept out. So you go parallel to the shore until you're out of the riptide. And usually the riptide, it's, it's a current. So it's not up and down the whole beach. It's in a particular spot. Don't ask me the science about it. Go look it up. Um, but what you do is you float above it. You don't fight it. You just float until you're out of it. And isn't it that way with cravings, right? You learn to count backwards from 17. You learn to breathe. You learn to not fight it. You just turn your attention somewhere else. So recovery, float out the riptide. Get a hobby. Hobbies are very healing. And when it comes to intimate activities, do a hobby with your partner. Do a hobby with the person you want to be connected with. The hobby has that paradox of being present and fully aware, this is what I'm doing in this moment, or this is what we are doing in this moment. And when you are done, you have something to show for it. You say, oh, look what we created. We put, we, you have to have something to create. And so when you're doing that together, very intimate building, intimacy building. Fellowship, going to your meetings, of course, fellowship. Thought stopping is using some kind of, I use uh, a prayer. I use the Lord's Prayer just because I know it. 
but when your thoughts are racing, and these are all things that when these things are getting in the way of doing being intimate in any number of ways with your partner, you do these exercises. So when your mind starts racing, you're obsessing about codependent thoughts or something, find a something, a poem, a song, a prayer that is more than the serenity prayer. That's very short. Find something longer that you can say, think about, repeat it two or three times. We don't want an absence. We don't want to say, oh, I'm not going to think about this. I'm not going to do this. I'm not. Saying not leaves a vacuum and nature abhors a vacuum. If you have a vacuum and don't have something to replace it, to put in it, then whatever you're trying to take out is going to go right back. So we want to do something that is action oriented. So thought stopping, action, structure your day. These are things that you probably all are familiar with. Um, artificial sweeteners. Hopefully you all know that artificial sweeteners are enormously addictive. Um, get some sun, exercise. When you're doing all these things, you will be capable of intimacy. So here's eight types of intimacy. You can practice these and look at look these over in your relationships, therapists. You can you know assign this to your clients. <clears throat> um, Louise, is, Louise, I'll get to that. Let me, let me race through here because we got three minutes. Um, eight types of intimacy. So you'll notice sexual is one. But you have all these other ways of expressing intimacy. So one of the things that I ask my clients to do a lot is to look at all these other things, aesthetic, that's beauty, music, art, affectional, holding hands, emotional, cry, laugh, intellectual, having a conversation, physical, recreational, non-sexual. Physical, recreational is doing some physical activity. Social, going out, going, doing activity, spiritual. Okay, so look at where are the deficit where, where are the things you need to beef up in your relationship because when you're doing all these other things as expressions of intimacy then sex will become one of them and you will be able to be more intimate and connected in recovery so we have a lot of behaviors just for i won't dwell on that because maybe that might be triggering for some of you but Again, we're not focusing on the behavior. Behaviors in and of themselves are just behaviors. It's the energy you bring into them. So we're not, we're going to be sex positive. We're not looking at anything as being bad or wrong or addictive in and of itself. It's, are you doing it to escape? Are you doing it to reach that higher level of stimulation? Are you doing it as pseudo intimacy? Are you doing it to control intimacy? Okay. So at the end of the day, in recovery, if you want to be in recovery, for everything you do, in every interaction with an intimate partner, you say, is this for my addiction or is this for my recovery? Or will this cause me to disconnect? Will this cause me to connect? And I start off every session when I first meet a couple, I start out with this disconnection and connection. You are here because you want to connect. You want to be more intimate in your recovery. So every decision you make, is this causing us to disconnect or causing us to connect? And if it's causing you to disconnect, then what are you doing it for? Then we need to talk about that. If it's causing you to connect, then you will be intimate and connected in recovery. There we go. So now let me look at, we have one minute to go. I'm happy to stay here at late. And um, Robert was concerned that we wouldn't get to the end. So we got to the end, Robert. And if you have any, um, Robert, if you have any particular, uh, anything that you wanted answered that we didn't get to, please. Um, I'm also available if anyone wants to contact me. It's... Uh, I'm at counselor at drcarolclark.com. My phone number is, um, you know, I'll just give you my phone number here, 703, so you can all write that down. And I'm really happy to, um, you know, pass the light. Uh, so Danielle back here was saying, um, 
Yes, that makes sense. I have struggled with entering treatment and recovery before my husband. I've struggled to know when is the time to leave since I recognize we do not all walk the same path in recovery. And I need to respect my own changing needs and readiness for greater intimacy with my partner. So we're talking about that intimacy by the numbers and two people moving forward in recovery and being able, both being able to connect. And Robert was saying, what is the difference between wanting what is best for my spouse and codependency? Other orientation attitude versus co-addiction. Thank you, Robert. That's a great question. You know, when you, um, there's one of those paradoxes. We can want what is best for the people we love. And we have no control over that. All we can do is bring our best selves to the table. And if I am bringing my best self, my recovering self, if I've identified what kind of person do I want to be? And I'm doing everything I can to be that person that I've identified my values, what's important. And I am being that person. I'm being congruent with that person. And I'm bringing that to my relationship. Then that's all I can do. If I'm trying to do anything else, that would be codependent. So if my spouse has different ideas about that, we can talk about it. We can but if we're both bringing our best selves to the relationship, we are definitely going to be connected. I hope, does that help? Danielle says, regarding lack of fear and in intimacy, what about the need for boundaries if people have shown themselves to be unable to be intimate? My mother has told me not to tell her anything going poorly in my life because she can't handle it. Well, you know, intimacy is like anything else, Danielle. Um, it's, it's on a continuum. You know, it's not all or nothing. And we're going to make decisions. That's creating healthy boundaries. We're going to make decisions uh, as we do every day with every person in our lives. How? What's the level of intimacy I'm going to have with this person? Now, there's levels of intimacy as far as I'm open. I'm, for, I'm a pretty open person. I'm going to be pretty open with everyone. I'm still not going to tell you every intimate detail of my life. You know, I'm not going to just vomit out stuff. <laughs> You know, there, we have to have boundaries. We all, we all have boundaries. So your mother is saying, I have a boundary. I do not want to hear this. So I would be respecting her boundary and recognize that the two of you look at the shoulds. Here's, here's a quickie for everybody. Should is a bad word. Should is the worst word. It's worse than any other word. Instead of should, I'm not going to take it away without replacing it. Say want or would like. Or wish, if you're talking about the past. So you have a should, you know, if you have a should here, like I should be really connected with my mother. Well, no, who says? You would like to. Maybe you see other women with their mothers and they have beautiful relationships and they're much closer than you and your mother are. And you can mourn that and say, gee, I wish it was different. And the reality is it's not. And if you keep giving it attention when your mother has this limitation, you're not going to get further. And this, again, with couples, it's going to be the same thing. You're all, in the end, going to make a decision about how intimate, how connected do I want to be and how intimate and connected can I be with this particular person? And for anyone who has children or, you know, you might choose to stay with someone where you don't have that really totally connected one-on-one -on -one relationship. And because there's other things, you're going to stay with this person because, you know, you're going to help the kids get through school or, you know, whatever it is. So you make those decisions. But what we want to do is work towards being capable of intimacy. And if we're with a person, another partner who wants to also be that capable of intimacy, then that's wonderful. And it's going to be a lot of hard work. Um, Louise says, I asked, does this thought serve me and go from there? Okay, so that's very similar to, is this for my addiction or is this for my recovery? Um, <clears throat> Nora says, thank you for sharing your work with us today. So you're very welcome, Nola. Nola, sorry. And uh, Robert's saying, what if we already do have um, intimacy in all categories except sexually? How do we break through in that category? So um, there's a lot of exercises um, you know, I would wonder what is getting in the way of that. And I would ask you if you're, there's still some, la there's a lack of intimacy. There's some fear. 
Okay. So I would say first, what's the fear? What's the fear with you and your partner um, meeting, being intimate sexually? There's a fear. Okay. And where's that? What's that fear about? Where's it coming from? And that fear has to do with, I'm trying to protect myself. I'm not being totally open. So I'm controlling it with these other, you know, I can be intimate with you talking and I can hold your hand, but I'm controlling how close I get to you. So we need to address that fear to be able to have that total openness. Now we can do it both healing the trauma, finding out what that fear is. And it could be maybe you've both done, uh, you know, if you're in a coupled relationship, you've both done all the, the child of origin work, you've done all this stuff, but there's still some trauma related to um, whoever it is in the relationship who was acting out. And so there's still that fear of what it means. What I do with couples is um, a lot of intimacy exercise, communication exercises in the office, talking, <laughs> talking, and um and, um, you know, looking at what, how, how can we get closer? What part are we not understanding? Um, you know, how, if I'm, if I'm a wife who's been with a sex addict partner who's been, and I found out about all this acting out, there's a lot of trauma there. There's a lot of work we're going to have to, that I'm going to have to do, and that we're going to have to do together before I can open up sexually. But in this work, in the couple's work we do, we're going to start recognizing, and this goes to trust again, that trust issue. We're going to start recognizing, feeling when we're connected and when we're not. So when I'm working with a couple and we're doing this connection work and, and we're eyeball to eyeball and we're talking and we're, ref we're doing the reflecting and we're being in the space it's uh, very similar to Imago. I, I did a little bit of training under Heidi Schleifer, um, for any of you who have heard of her. So there's this work where when we're eyeball to eyeball, we're going to start feeling that connection. And conversely, we're going to feel when it's missing. And that's where we build trust. So I may never be able to trust my partner.